Hi, and welcome to Yeshiva Sheva Aver. <clears throat> I'm Rabbi David Katz, and you are listening to the first class in our new series, <clears throat> which will be called Thinking Shabbos. Thus, this is Thinking Shabbos number one, the Thinking Shabbos series first class. The, the intentions or topics covered will be always two themes, whether individual or simultaneous. Shabbos, i.e. for the gear, <clears throat> with Jewish, uh, what's called reflections, and contemplation, the concept of contemplating for gear. Uh, in Hebrew, it's seichel. You can use intellect, but I think contemplation is the, is the right word. Let's go. We're starting a brand new series. If you're listening to this, you're coming in the on the tail end of the end of the Gear series. We do the Parsha series on Sunday or Monday, based on how much the kids have driven me insane. For anybody wondering why class has been erratic either on Sunday or Monday, uh, coming off off of Shabbos, the kids can be a little bit draining. So. Uh, it's it might be just enough to get the article out, and if I can teach Sunday night, thank God. Otherwise, the article should be out on Sundays, and class will be on Monday. That's the, that's how it's been since we moved the class off of Shabbos. As in, I used to teach Saturday night, write the article Friday. Now we just moved everything kind of lateral one degree. And if again, if I can teach on on Sunday night, look for it. We're teaching on Sunday night. Emails will go out on Sunday. Uh, giving the uh, the schedule of the week. Look for it. And the Gear series is the other class, which is on Wednesdays. And that was orchestrated to be a tutorial to the non gear educated world, meaning everyone went through a period in time. I guess they'll say, looking back in history, they'll say, once upon a time, there was a bunch of people that didn't know what the gear was. Because I, I think we ended that little saga, did we not? I think we, 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 we quenched that fire, if I'm not mistaken. I think everybody on the planet Earth now has heard of the gear series, right? It, it, either in negative or positive form, but everyone's now heard of it, it seems like. The intention of the gear series, which lasted 1 through 22, but we we're missing 1, so it's actually 1 through 20. Kind of like buildings that don't have the 13th floor. Right, was to educate about the gear in the Tanakh and uh, the writings of the Torah. And we started 1, 2, 3, all the way down to 21. We use King David sometimes. We use the Talmud. We use logic. We use reality. We use the Torah. Everywhere we could find a gear reference that was kind of a home run, we used it. And when we first started, if you think back, how many people out there didn't know what the gear was? You know, on, on all the venues of forums and discussions, you know, is there a gear and does he really exist? Is this uh, a figment of the imagination? And, you know, some people wanted to believe, some people fought, some people were skeptical. And I, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I believe that <clears throat> once we concluded gear 21, I think we had mission accomplished. You guys agree with that? Maybe a one or two on the screen. I'm pretty sure it's a one. Yeah, Bob, what do you say? What do you What do you say? You seen the uh, You seen the discussions around the, around the net? Is this uh, mission accomplished on that one? Oof. <laughs> well, it's out there. Whether people are talking negative or positive. It's at least worth a discussion nowadays. Whereas before, it was it was not even getting airtime to be discussed. So the fact that it's being discussed is a very positive thing. And we ended last last week, number twenty one, with you know the Sinai experience, revelation of of what was Sinai and and how was the gear integral at Sinai all the way to the Ten Commandments, the the gear who is to rest on Shabbos. Which the Talmud then calls him a Geert Sedek. And we've dealt with the Geert Sedek issue and now Shabbos issue. And uh, we ended. We ended class number 21. 
And this week is number one in the new series, Thinking Shabbos. Matters of contemplation, matters of Shabbos concerning the gear. Go ahead and make two updates. Um, made a little bit of a mistake last week. You know, no diamond is perfect, I guess. The Rambam that I mentioned, where a non-Jew, he used the word goy, he cannot keep Shabbos, and then a Ben Noach can do the mitzvahs. I said chapter 9, halacha 10 and, uh, 9 and 10. My book was hard to read. I did not see it right. It is chapter 9 and halacha 9, and chapter 10 and halacha 10. Pardon me. Uh, everything else should check out okay. Uh, I knew this Rambam thing, but... Sometimes you just see it wrong and you make a mistake. Okay, and the last thing I want to say. Uh, good news should be going out, just to make people a little bit of uh, excitement. Tomorrow, uh, if all goes according to plan, the Ger Shabbat and the Ger Tzedek, who is a non-Jew, shall be committed to writing in rabbinic literature called Shilas and Shuvas. Responsa, and with, with God willing, it will be uh, it will be recorded in rabbinic writing that there is in fact a contemporary issue and allowance of the Ger Shabbat for rabbis to see on record as having proven to be true. And Ger Tzedek, who is a non-Jew, as well as a convert, but as well as a non-Jew, shall be included in these writings. If all goes well. Tomorrow it is it is etched in stone, so to speak, and it will be available for anybody doing research. Basically, uh, it's now part of the literature. So hopefully that goes well. All right, that's all for introductions. Let's go. Gear series one through twenty through twenty one. What am I saying? We just finished the gear series. Think back, just just get a get a grasp of what this is. Gear number one, if you if you remember, was locating the the hundred some locations of gear in the Torah. We have about a hundred, and we mentioned you know Abraham and Sarah were making garim. Uh, Abraham is gear v'toshav. I am, he said. Uh, you know, we, we, we're using very scriptural definition. <clears throat> and that was the course all the way through, let's say, number 20. By then, it was uh, more of a, of a philosophy of life. You know, what am I? How do I identify? So it became, it became a, you know, a, a wisdom of Torah, not just a, a verse and a definition you know, it became a total angle and perspective of the Torah. The whole gear. Really, by that time, it superseded this Noahide expression. You know, and as a religious movement. And the gear really became a personal endeavor. To me as well. By number 21, the final class, we saw the culmination of the gear Shabbat. The Ger Shabbat was brought down, and we brought about a trillion sources, and pretty much ended debate, is there a Ger Shabbat? And when that final hammer came down, there really wasn't much more to say about the Ger. By that point, it would be a broken record. You know, one more verse, one more Ger Toshav reference, one more Ger Tzedek reference. So I'll just make this statement and we'll move on and, and totally move on. Anybody that has a question about Garam, non-Jews in Torah, Garam in the in the verses, what gear is this? You know, the Vaikra 100, 100. It's a fictitious place, but you know, any any place where you find the word gear and you want to know which one is it, is it me, or is it him, is it her? Uh, does he keep Shabbos? Does it keep Shabbos? Whatever questions there are, it is an open invitation. Rabbi Katz at virtueyeshiva.com. Let me know your gear questions, and uh, I, I, sh I will have pleasure answering those questions. The classes are now done. Uh, correspondence may now begin. 
I think we're all comfortable enough to to comfortably correspond on these issues, and the gear the gear series should have served its purpose. And the purpose is to get to the Thinking Shabbos series, class number one. We have just now done the introduction. Now, what are the two pillars of thought into this series? First is Shabbos. Who, what, when, where, how, why? A basic fact, frequently asked questions of Shabbos for the gear. How do we do it? When do we do it? Where do we do it? Um, you know, corresponding with you know Jewish Shabbos, how is it? And how can we how can we do our Shabbos? I.e., do we want to be like Jews? Do we want to be not like Jews? Do we want to be with Jews? Do we want to be without Jews? Uh, you know, Jews keep Shabbos. This is just a fact. It's a historic fact. Garam now are coming into it for the first time, probably in about two thousand years. Now, if the state of Israel can pick up where it left off after 2,000 years. And you see it did. And it's thriving. You know, it was good. It was really eradicated for 2,000 years. and came back to life. Then the Ger Shabbat also. Why should it not come back to life and thrive? You know, all the Jewish Shabbos have collected, you know, the, the feelings and emotions and everything have been absorbed into that seventh day. The, the garum of, his, of, the, of ancient history, their tears are also there. And their sweat of, 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 of exhilaration is also there. There's no reason why, if Shabbos has returned the goods to the Jews, let's say after the Holocaust, which I'll get into, right, or after any, any, um, any, any break in tradition, you know, whether it be a death or moving or exile, redemption, Shabbos you know, has received and it is given. The secrets of Shabbos are contained in Shabbos and therefore Shabbos gives to those that keep it. If that's true for the Jews, there's no reason why the Garim who made investments 2,500 years ago into that Shabbos, why they would not get dividends back. They say that in the Garden of Eden, the, the grapes have been fermenting for 6,000 years. And that in the end of days, they're gonna, we're going to taste the wine of those grapes. Well, the Jewish Shabbos has been fermenting for almost 6,000 years. And the Garim are part of that fermentation process. And God is just, God is good, that those dividends will be paid back. So once the garum get get going in the Shabbos, I think we're going to see you know a really cultural phenomenon. You know what happens when you put the ghetto Jew of Krakow into the state of Israel fifty years later? You you get an Israeli eating falafel. Just kidding, <laughs> but you you get the Israeli. You get a culture of people. You get you know, you know the world's newest religion in Zionism, which I'll go into what that means. It's you know Judaism revitalized as political and military. Whether you agree with it or not, as in terms of is it essential Judaism, the Jewish people are identified by that, and worldwide Jewry is supporting that. Now, again, philosophically, is it right or wrong? Is not the issue. It's it's a fact. It does exist, and exists after those people were gone for two thousand years. And it's not like they were here but not here. They were gone. Europe was a real Jewish threshold. And now they're back, 1948. And you see, the land is giving dividends. The ancient Israeli, the farming, it's all coming back. Shabbos functions very much the same way. In fact, they're synonymous. The land is synonymous with the Kabbalistic linkage of Malchus, the kingship. Shabbos is also that seventh level. And you know who else is that seventh level? Just a bunch of people called the Gertzedek. So the same property exists for all of the seventh level. Again, if the land of Israel has sprouted and bloomed after 2,000 years, and we know that Shabbos is a major part of this, then why should the Gerim not sprout also? Once that Shabbos is tapped into, why will they not sap into that 
frequency. And in fact, I think they will. The more it happens, the more they go there. You're going to find nothing short of ancient wisdom coming through that wormhole. You're going to be tapping into the real deal. Whatever Garam did, first temple, second temple, before the first temple, every you know, every ancient gear in the world, and you name them, Noah, Shem, all the way through the forefathers, first temple, hanging out with the Kenites, the Rechabites. When you're talking major, major people here, the second temple, all of the supporters of Hanukkah and Purim. Then you have in the last 2,000 years, the, 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 the hidden garum of God only knows where they were. But I know that every great rabbi in the, two, the last 2,000 years was inspired by great garum. So they, they were, they've never been disappeared, just like the state of Israel was never, let's say, totally you know, just divorced from consciousness. The garum have never been divorced from consciousness either. Only now it's no longer history upon him. You know, God's hidden face, it's revealed. It's very revealed, and therefore the Garam and their Shabbos has now become revealed. And it's going to be very exciting to see Garam coming out of the woodwork and the Shabbos day inspiring them <clears throat> from that wine, let's say, of creation, 6,000 years of fermentation. In fact, you know who you are when you when your your name means the fermentation of wine. That's what that's 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 the analogy. Someone someone they know who they are. The fermentation of wine, like the six I said, about the six thousand years of creation, or the wine, the grapes of of Garden of Eden have been fermenting for six thousand years. The Ger Shabbat has been fermenting for that same time, and those that have that in their name should understand what that means. The concept of, of, of having the uh, dividend is a stupid word, but what's the word for dividend? Yeah, vintage. I guess vintage. You're right. The vintage of those Shabbases in the Garam over 6,000 years. Okay. Now, two principles of action here. The Noahide laws can be seen as din, judgment, stern and rigid, right? Do this or die, kind of a thing, right? And on the flip side, you can say it's very Rachmanistic, very merciful. When, when you look on the way, you know, coming down on somebody, it's judgmental. Yet when you're, when you're, when you're striving to achieve, it's very merciful. And when you're striving to achieve merciful, you're actually going to get judgment put on you. And when you when you are, are being judgmental, then you're actually that's when you'll find everybody who wants to be merciful on you. This is a perfect system. If you're being small minded, people say, Come on, grow up, come on. If you're being a pioneer, they say, Hey, 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 hey. The seven laws of the seven laws of Noah parallel the seven spherot, the emanations in the world of Atzilus, the highest spiritual world. And those seven laws kind of define those worlds, each sphere. And the way that we interact with these spherot on this wavelength, says the Zohar, is by asking questions. And the nature of a question to a rabbi is judgmental. Rabbi, is it true I die if I steal this pencil? The rabbi says, yes, you do die if you steal that pencil. Say, thank you, rabbi. I appreciate hearing all about death. Have a nice day. <clears throat> Yet, when the rabbi then takes the judgment question with the inclination from the asker Hey, Rabbi, tell me what I cannot do. <clears throat> this is not just a Noahide thing. This is a Jewish thing also. Everybody wants to ask questions to find out what they can't do. 
So the rabbi who is small-minded will tell you all about what you can't do. Whereas the Zohar is saying, you know, we need to grow. We need to advance. He needs to flip it to a positive. And that's the, that's where judgment is turned into mercy. So rabbi, tell me what I can't do. The rabbi thinks about it. What he does is when the, when the answer comes down, he tells them all about what he can do. So here's a good example. Is Rabbi, tell me all about how it's stealing from a Jew if I keep Shabbos. And the answer is, well, a Ben Noah, you know, the whole class number 21 before Sinai, that would be stealing, you know, so to speak, blah, blah, blah. It's a whole, a whole idea. But if you go with Din Yisrael, the, the idea that Sinai, the Torah, Shabbos, all was included in Sinai with Israel receiving this for the world, to accept the seven laws through these means is to become synonymous with Ger Toshav or Chosid Omos Olam, righteous to the nations, and you may keep Shabbos. So you, there's a spin. You took the negative and you make it a positive. The seven laws are basically negative, except for what? Making court of law, which is to bring out more negative. So the contemplation aspect of Noahide of Ger is the positive. Right? There, if you want to go positive, then it's through contemplation. What, what, is, what did the rabbi do? Right? Rabbi, is it true I'm stealing if I keep Shabbos? Right? Tell me about how I die. I mean, this is the way the world is. I'm sorry to tell you, but you already know this. So the rabbi then can play into it. He also doesn't contemplate. Yet if he contemplates, that means what is he doing? He's trying to bring a positive on this. Yeah, I can say, well, if you if you uh, if you brush your hair on Shabbos, that's like that's like giving Shabbos like a Jew, and therefore you die that way. And yeah, I can tell you about fifty thousand ways I can make it up. Unfortunately, people do that too. But the creative contemplation, you take the negative and contemplate, bring it down in the form of a positive, where the the, the judgment becomes merciful. According to Kabbalah, that is that is what it's all about. That is the seven spheroes, seven laws working to perfection. That is the Kabbalistic universe, where the Noahide is the component of the Kabbalistic universe. Seven lower spheroes, seven laws of Noah, upper three, which in Hebrews Gimel Rishonim, the first three, Rosh Hashanah's initial letter, letter spells Ger. Gimel Rishonim, Ger. Thus, the entire Kabbalistic model is parallel or synonymous with the Noahide doctrines as the vessels that make it work. Now, there's, there's more to it than that. <clears throat> but in terms of the basic model, that is the model. <clears throat> Thus, you have a very simple scenario and demographic of the world. Those that don't contemplate and want to keep it negative they have seven laws of Noah put upon them. I have seven things I can't do. Have a nice day, everybody. Anything more than that, we're going to kill you. We're very serious. Then you have those that want to contemplate. Contemplation will lead to positive. Positive leads to mercy. Mercy leads to light. Light leads to God. It's not an accident that those that are, that, those that are without contemplation remain in the negative and judgment, don't even bring God into the seven laws of Noah. That is not an accident. Now here's something very interesting. If you don't contemplate, you will not arrive to a Sinai conclusion. You'll probably be too busy arguing about contemplation, what it means. I mean, if you're not going to contemplate, then all you can do is argue. But if somebody brings up a good point, what does that mean, you bring up a good point? It means, you, means you're contemplating. Wow, I didn't think about what you said. That's already contemplation. So if somebody will not hear what you're saying, that means, hi, my name is uh, XYZ, and I am not a contemplator. I like to argue. That person will, sh will, will, will show their colors. 
Yet once you start to contemplate, that is the movement factor of the path of the righteous Gentile, so to speak. Because once you contemplate, you open your mind to the Creator. Once you are acknowledgingly serving the deity called Hashem, meaning we are all serving God, whether we like it or not, the question is how aware of that do we wish to become? And, you know, a simple answer would be the more you contemplate, you get all the way through. And let's say, I mean, look, this is going to sound dodgy, but let's say that means it's becoming Jewish. Yet who says the intention is to cross over that line? Dennis Rodman in basketball could have been, by his own admission, a great offensive player. Could have been great. But Dennis Rodman, the rebounder defender, for those that follow Bulls, 1996 through 1998, basketball, he was the greatest defender rebounder of all time. Where everybody else is thinking progression, linear, ball in hoop, linear, Dennis Rodman is forever thinking lateral. The ball bounces laterally, not linearly. You're not going to chase the ball into the stands. There's a backboard. There's a, there's a boundary. At that point, it goes left and right. Now, if your name is Michael Jordan, maybe you want to be the greatest scorer of all time or represent that philosophy of scoring. But there are many components to basketball. Scoring might be the most attractive to the viewer, but to, let's say, the creator of basketball or the enthusiast, perhaps linear is not the best, but lateral. In fact, any purist of basketball will tell you lateral is more pure. It's much greater of an impact to watch Dennis Rodman play than Michael Jordan in terms of basketball. In terms of the aesthetics, maybe you like Michael Jordan. The same analogy can be used for Jews and Garam. A non-Jew that wants to convert, have fun, convert, go ahead. I wish you luck as a Jew. At the same time, that contemplation may lead in a, in a lateral that is actually linear. For you, it's straight. There's no right or wrong. It's just, what do you wish to contemplate? At that point, God is everywhere without boundary. Who's to say what is lateral or linear? The contemplation aspect of Noahide, of Ger, is, is the message of the Creator to you. What if you are being asked to unravel knot after knot that in the end of all knots you become Jewish? Or let's say reach the goal or target or whatever word you want to use. Thus, the destination is not the primal cause here, but it's the journey. I mean, there are many ways of looking at this, male and female. So some souls might be called to convert. Some rabbis might want to be dealing with garam. Some might not. Some garam might want to go lateral linear. The whole point is contemplate. Let God move your vessel. Let God decide where and what you do and where you go. But at least open up to God. There's no point in saying, all I know is I do seven laws, I don't budge. I don't talk, I don't move, I don't think. Now, you're not right, you're not wrong for doing that. You, you're allowed to say, God, leave me alone, go away. You're allowed. But understand that according to the Torah, it's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to think. But there's a big difference between wrong and what, and, and what you're supposed to do. Jews are supposed to be tzaddikim, let's say. But are they wrong for, for thinking small? Yes and no. But I mean, do you kill a guy for thinking small? No. But you smack him on the side of the head and say, come on, get with the program. So it's a, it's a, it's a very... Strong idea to be a minimalist, to be safe. 
And this is all God wants of me. The Talmud speaks about Shomer Kishuin. The easiest job in the world is watching squash grow. And that's what a seven law advocate is doing. He is watching squash grow. Minimalist, minimalist, minimalist. And I'm, I'm okay with that. I, I am okay with that. Feel free. Have a great time. And there's, a, there's an arena for that. But it's, it's very negative. Very, very, very negative. Not open to anything but watching squash grow. Once he wishes to go positive, to bring light into his life, movement, get off the chair from watching the squash grow, find God in the world, relate and interact with God, take on positive commandments, have activity, have a sixth day, seventh day. Totally different style. It's bringing in the male and female together. That's through contemplation. Maybe you want to not convert just so you can contemplate every Shabbos. As a gear. There's, a mil there's endless ways of cutting this up. The creativity is endless. What one wishes to do with, with contemplation. This is really the Torah of Amun of Rabbi Nachman. Go anywhere, do anything. You know, hey, what's it like to be, uh, you know, keeping Shabbos on the range in Arizona? I don't know. Have fun. Now, when you can't do malacha or work on Shabbos, it's pretty hard. I have two little kids. I am not packing up and taking off and going to sleep on someone's floor with my kids on Shabbos. So I am bound by my doc by my beliefs. One might say my Shabbos are miserable and boring if they were to watch what I do, which I'll get into at the end of the class. Or next week, God willing, if we have time, this is taking I went a little bit over time today. Now, if I was not Jewish and I was in my same position with two kids, I'll tell you what I would do. I would be going everywhere. Pick up. You know, go to a hotel, put the TV on for the kids, live it up. What is Shabbos like in every city in the country if I have to? Again, with kids, it is nearly impossible. You are, they're very much creatures of their, of their environment. And we have a very Shabbos home where I live. So that is my Jewish expression of Shabbos. The gear has been given the gift by God to experience it in a totally different light. Maybe there are people out there that want to do that. Maybe they want to make it as Jewish as possible. Maybe they want to make it as un-Jewish as possible. Contemplation. You have that freedom, that gift. That is your movement. The gear has the ability to pick up and go and not look back. How fantastic of a lifestyle is that? That, to me, is, is, the, is the definition of exciting. And I'll never know it. So imagine, you might not know what I do on Shabbos. I'll never know what you do. We get together and talk about it. That's dynamic. That's two aspects of Shabbos that neither one or the other can do. So only the partnership and the team effort can really see what that one's going through. And what's coming through that wormhole on Shabbos? Thus, if you, if, you, if you negate the contemplation and remain grounded spiritually, there's, there's not much dynamic behavior going on, which is okay. Again, go ahead. The question is, does one choose darkness or light? Jews are the same way. Don't get me wrong on this. There are many Jews that have rejected light, not interested. Not interested in Mazal and God, Kabbalah, spirituality, you know, growing and seeing the gear. Just let me do what I do and leave me alone. Everybody has their choices. My personal preference, light, contemplation, moving, growth. 
And there's everything in between. Some people might want to contemplate for a week at a time, then stop. Maybe I, I'm happy doing six minutes vote, and Rabbi, that's all enough for me. Maybe I just want to remember the Shabbos day, say Shabbat Shalom to somebody, and that's enough. We're, everybody needs to find their comfort zone. And that comfort zone then can find maybe new comfort zones. This is the great part about the, the Noahide Shabbos for Garam. The sky is the limit. If maybe what you're, you're offended that I'm calling you boring and you say, I like negativity, I'm sorry. Go ahead. My opinion is it's boring. You know, to, to wish you know negativity and, and can't wait to kill somebody for stealing a pencil, and, and that is the essence of your spirituality, uh, the Torah says that that's not what it's about. But you have your right to think that, and more power to you. But when Israel goes around spreading the Torah, when the Mashiach comes, the idea will be to bring Shabbos to the world, light to the world, God to the world, Mazal to the world. So it will be a very interesting predicament to see what happens when that clash takes place. This is just a side note I'm going to say now. I don't know if it means anything to you, but it's, it should be stated. The idea is that Torah is the essence of Shabbos. And the way that you come to sanctify the Torah is through prayer. That if I set up prayer, then for sure I'll have time for Torah. Whereas if I only go for Torah, I might not get to it without prayer. During the week is a time of prayer. So what do you do to, to, to keep the prayer going? Set up times for Torah. If my week is strong with Torah, I will have prayed, and all the more so I will have Torah, all the more so I will be infused for Shabbos to have more Torah, and I will have the prayer behind me to set up prayer. So if you want to keep Shabbos, go for Torah. If you want Torah, have Torah during the week. If you want Torah during the week, set up prayer on Shabbos. That way you'll have it during the week. And the next thing, the response uh, that I'm going to write, just I want to, I'm just kind of laying out some points right now. The classes are going to get more specific as we go. Don't worry. I'm just laying out big ideas that we're probably going to visit a billion times over the next course of this of this class. And I have no idea how many classes this will be. I have no idea. It'll be at least two. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I don't think we're going to cover everything today. I'm guessing between 20 and 50, just for a guess. The Gerd Sedek. I'm going to go ahead and explain it now um, because it does matter for Shabbos. And uh, it's interesting. The Ten Commandments, obviously, you know, mentions the Gerd that keeps Shabbos is the Gerd Sedek. The Gerd Sedek is the one who uh, you know has has a desire for Shabbos. He's not a Gerd Toshav who maybe they'll say for, you know, with this reason, that reason. This is a Gerd who really wants to keep Shabbos. Now here's here's the logic why Gerd Siddiq is a non-Jew. Ready for this? I know we ended the Gerd series. I'm aware of that. But the Ten Commandments is referring to uh, a Gerd. And the, the Talmud says Gerd Siddiq. So this will be part of the Gerd series a little bit, or the, the, the Thinking Shabbos series. Just always keeping aware what is a Gerd Siddiq. Because uh, the rest of the world will tell you that you're crazy, and it's only a convert, and it's actually not only a convert. Anybody that saw on Facebook today, I actually posted this. Uh, I think this is a true statement. Judaism defines the gear as a convert, whereas the Torah will tell you a gear is a gear is a gear. I think that's a very true statement. You know, in the laws of Judaism, you know, the gear is a convert, but in the Torah, which is more much broader and va more vast than Judaism and more ancient than this and that. The, the gear is a gear. Now here's the idea. Mitch Hedberg says a joke. It's a famous comedian. He's dead now, but the comedian goes like this. It's not the photographer's fault. Bigfoot is just blurry. <laughs> it's, it's not that the photographer got a bad picture of Bigfoot. Bigfoot just is blurry. That's my joke. That's his joke, my joke. And the reason why I say this joke, 
is because every time you see Gerd Sedek, right, you will never find a rabbi saying it's either a convert or a non-Jew. And this is what brings up the debate. You know, Rabbi Katz, why do you say it's a non-Jew and obviously it's a convert and stop making war and controversy? The answer is Bigfoot is just blurry. The Ger Tzedek is just blurry. It is actually two. It is never one. Right? You, whenever you say Ger Tzedek, it is always a double connotation. Now, the verse that the Talmud Bava Metzia 111b uses is in re reference to do not withhold wages of the Ger Tzedek, or the Ger. The Talmud says Ger Tzedek. And what the intention of the verse in the Torah is, is the destitute of Israel. And the Pene Yeshua commentary says, we are actually using this verse to bring out a revelation of the destitute of Israel. And the Ger Toshav and the Ger Tzedek are the destitute of Israel. And it's also the, the, of, the, of the Jew, who's called Achicha, your brother is also part of the destitute of Israel. So it's either a Jew, a Ger Tzedek, or a Ger Toshav. Now, what does it mean, a destitute of Israel? If you're a Jew and you're not destitute, are you mentioned in this verse? The answer is no, because you're not destitute. If you are a convert and you are not destitute, you are right there where you got to be. Are you destitute of Israel? No, you're a Jew. You're not a Gerd Sedek even. You're a Jew. Okay. Now, Gerd Sedek number one with the attribute of judgment placed on him. Imagine the Gerd Sedek convert. Right? He has a questionable base in. He has renounced his Judaism to which the Rambam says harsh on Israel like thorns or garum. He hates Jews. Hates Jewish people. Hates Israel. Hates Kugel. Hates Haman Tarshin. He even hates whatever. But he has a strange infatuation with living amongst Jews. And don't think this is crazy, because I know people like this. This actually exists. So people are going to, the, the Talmud puts on him, he's a geared Sedic. It's not exactly a compliment. Right? It's almost like, it's a, you're saying, oh, the righteous Gare. Right? You harsh on Israel like thorns or garum. So you're saying, oh, the righteous one? You really don't want him around. Not because he's potentially not Jewish. He's A, he's Jewish. B, he's just not a nice guy. And he's a destitute of Israel, and there are laws concerning him. That's the Gerd Sedek. Then you have a Gerd Toshav. This guy's been around for 50 years. He keeps his seven. And he is not interested in anything. Talk about negative. This guy invented negativity. It's the judgment aspect. He's not interested. He lives outside of every city. He lives in Israel because he gets cheap you know, tax benefits. He keeps his seven. He's not an idolater. Seven go to heaven. Leave me alone. Have a nice day. We say, come on. Can't you like soften up? You've been around for 50 years. You you have to eat pig and you have to not keep you have to do all this stuff in Israel, and he's just stubborn about it. So these are the destitute of Israel. Now at the same time, you have a Ger Toshav. Hey everybody, I'm from uh, Detroit. I just moved to Israel. Yeah, it's really good. I just went to Basin, and I acknowledged you know by Basin I do not do idolatry. I keep the seven laws. This is awesome. I'm keeping Shabbat. I have a little house outside the city, and Bizarre Hashem, I'm, I'm moving up in the world. Now, this is that same Ger Toshav, but he's not judgment, he's not coming from Din. He's Rachamim, he's Chesed, he's part of the community, he's coming in. He's upward, not downward. Now, technically, he is the destitute of Israel because he simply what he does not have. By experience, mandated reasons, what to have. You know, if something, God forbid, happens to him, he doesn't have family. Let's say it's a Jewish, you know, protexia 
you know, closed caption society, he might not have too much funds. We have a mitzvah to help him, and by God we will. Then you have Mr. Gerd Sedek. Now this guy, he moved into the community. He was the Gerd Toshav. He's in the community. He's going to classes. Maybe he's teaching Torah. He's keeping Shabbos, like Christus 9b. He breaks one law every week to keep from going over. He's eating kosher. He is the best of the lot. What a guy he is. But he's also destitute. There are people that don't understand. You know, he hasn't totally cracked the code of what Judaism is on an inner level. Well, so he also has lacking. But what a great guy. He is as kind and, and rachamim as it gets. Then you have, um, let's just say, you know, he, he, the, the guy who converts or totally absorbed into Israel, whether he converted or not converted, he's no longer destitute. You're not part of the verse. You're not here. You are part of Israel. Cohen, Levi, Israel, Ger. End of story. You're not destitute. The Pasuk doesn't talk about you. So for every Ger Toshav, Ger Tzedek Jew, you see two sides of the coin. Does everyone see this? This should be a, a definition you should become acquainted with because if all goes well tomorrow, this will be written in stone. Right? So, you know, mate, you're, you're, it's up to you. You're either looked down upon with what you're being looked at as or you're looked at as, as, as the best, you know, best guy around. And this is not by the dictations of religion. This is a, this is a, a psychological fact. Right? If you're going to be the, the bummer, people are, you know, you're, you're going to be a bummer. If you're enthusiastic and you're excited and you're a pleasure to be around, no matter what part of the world, it's a different attitude. But for every station, we can look at it two ways. Oh, the Gerd Sedek who's on his way out. Or you can say the Gerd Sedek who's on his way in. The Gerd Toshav who's just hanging around. Or the Gerd Toshav who's, who's the best. So that's that's the idea of the Gerd Sedek um, in a very halachic sense. How a Gerd Sedek can be a Jew and a non-Jew at the same time. Again, Bigfoot is just blurry. <laughs> the Gerd Sedek is just blurry. It's always two. Right? You can never say one or the other. There's always a reason to say this one or that one. And let me go ahead and close with this idea. We'll do one more idea and we'll close. Croesus 9b in the Talmud tells you three ways that a Ger Toshav keeps Shabbos. And we bring Naaman as the essence of the Ger Toshav. Now you'll say, wait a minute. What do we know about Naaman? Of Kings, was it chapter 2, for Kings 2? or Kings 2, chapter 5. Naaman, you probably will not know that much. Nobody will. What's the answer? Contemplation. Allow yourself to contemplate Naaman. And you will receive. It's a fact. This is true for all Noahide Torah. If you want to know about Shem, the Torah of Shem, Noahide, Ger, because it was not written down in 2,000 years, we have gems here and there as like points of dimension to focus on. But allow yourself to, to contemplate, put the ideas together, and you will get Noahide Torah. And the, the Shabbos is the, the foundation of that. Contemplation on Shabbos is the foundation of that. There are three ways to keep Shabbos. Like a holiday of Israel, where certain... Labor is permitted. Like Chol Moed, the intermediary days of Sukkot and Passover, where even more work is permitted as a basis of every Shabbos. Or simply treating it like a mundane day, but having the day in mind. Those are the three ways of keeping Shabbos. A Gerd Sedek who makes it through every step of the way, he will inch more towards the Jewish Shabbos, and, of course, the Ger Toshav, on the minimalist level, he has the most minimal opinion. And it seems that when you are accepted for a base din, you are then obligated in Shabbos, even if it's on the minimal level. 
But there are two levels of acceptance, being accepted and being and being of uh, guarding the Shabbos. You may guard the Shabbos without accepting it, and thereby you're not obligated. When you accept it for three scholars of Israel, then you're obligated. One need not become obligated. He, it is acceptable to be in a status of keeping until he feels comfortable. And the breaking of Shabbos is through Ochel Nefesh, food for the soul. The wine breaks in the Jew house and he has no backup and the store next door sells wine. The Jew may not go and buy wine. He is breaking Shabbos. The non-Jew says, I have $5. My neighbor sells wine. Guys, I'll be right back. I'm going to buy a bottle of wine. He may do that for Ochel Nefesh. Everyone's here. The party began. And we want to, we all agreed to have wine. And it's a real bummer if we don't. So that's Ochel Nefesh. You need to smoke a cigarette, smoke a cigarette. You need to watch TV to stay sane after 24 hours of Shabbos, watch TV. Whatever you need to stay good, comfortable, thriving, keeping the Shabbos holy, to the point where you're not cursing it in your head. When the wine breaks, don't say, man, this sucks. Oh, man. No, don't do that. Do what you got to do to keep the flavor going. Throw coals on the fire. Do what you got to do to keep the spirit happy and joyous and contemplative. Right? You forgot to turn the air conditioner on. It's very hot. And now you can't contemplate. Put the air conditioner on. Then go contemplate. Then you say, but if I leave it on too long, my bill's going to be outrageous and I don't want to pay a bill. I don't want to think about money on Shabbos. So turn it off. So a lot of people will end on this note. A lot of people will repeat this. They'll say, you know, there's a, a rabbi saying that the, the goyim can keep Shabbos. And then the Jews will say, no, they die if they do that. So A, we're not talking about the Jewish Shabbos. B, these are not goyim. C, what we're talking about is Croesus. D, E, F, G. The point is, the intention here is not to keep a Jewish Shabbos. Why? Because that is the opposite of contemplation at this point. Right? I think what the, the real focal point is the Gerim, who are holding by Din Yisrael and Sinai, they have all the, the what to rely upon opinions of how it's done. I think the basic premise is knowing that you can. Knowing that you can, there you know, it's all covered. You have the three opinions. The rabbis figured it out. The Gerah keeps Shabbos through Sinai. Just know you can. It's not a time to be mockbeed. Mockbeed means like a stickler. Now, you might be a stickler on certain things. You want this kind of wine or you want the TV on. You want it off. I mean, no, no discussion. Maybe you're fickle. Maybe you're not. The point is, this is not about being Jewish trying to be Jewish, imitating Jews. This is about you and contemplation and God and positive and mercy and sweetening judgment, being spiritual, having light, being spiritually refreshed. The nature of Shabbos is hard work. You are to work hard spiritually on Shabbos. So any Ben Noah as brought by a pre-Sinai condition, simply seeking a day off of work and a rest day, that is not what we're doing here. This is hard work. God rested on the seventh day and sanctified it because on, the, on that day he rested from all his work that he created to do, says Kiddush. He rested from all of his work that he created to do. Creative spiritual work is hard work. We want to use our mind, contemplate, work, travel, go, lift, sweat, exert, spiritually. It's the one day you can sit down and do that. Think things through. Think laterally, la la largely laterally. 
It's the one day you don't have to do physical labor and, and do this and that. Sit down, maybe have a glass of wine, make kiddish, talk about God, have your friends over, and let your mind work hard. It's liberation when the mind works hard. It's slavery to say, you know, to, to do menial work. Secular study work. That is bondage in a nutshell. Mind control. I tell you how to think. I tell you what to do. Let your mind out. God will tell you what to think and God will tell you what to do. And that is hard work. And you will find that you feel rested and replenished when it's over. Saturday night, make of Dalek, go to a party, Malava Malka. Sunday, go back to work and feel good about yourself. And that's what this is about. Turning those negatives to positives, the judgments into kindnesses, having the support of ancient, or let's say, you know, the, the Chazal, saying it's okay. No, you can. Know what you're doing. Know what the intentions are. Don't let people tell you what you're doing. You know what you're doing. And I'll, I'll, I'll actually leave off with this. The Kabbalistic word, the Bahir, says very clearly, in, in analogous terms, God has a bride, the bride he took for Shabbos. He has two sons, and he says, why don't you guys keep it with me? After all, all that I do is for you to keep it with me. The whole creation, the creation of evil and of Odazara was to get the Garam through so that in the end of days they'd come out and they'd say, woof, not again. We want God, we want light, we want growth. We want positive. We want mercy. They are the nation chosen to say idolatry is wrong. There are no other gods. Israel is created to say, I am Hashem, your God. So the first two commandments in Sinai are taken up by the two nations, the Jews and the Garam are part of the house of Israel. One house of Israel, four parts, Garam, along with Cohen, Levi, Israel, to say, I am Hashem, your God. You shall have no other gods. Sinai is it. Because in Sinai, the Garam stand there after 6,000 years saying, okay, we just got here. Where is everybody? The Jews saying, we left. We've been keeping Shabbos for, for thousands of years. Only who was not at Sinai? Moses and Jethro. Moses was busy talking to God. Jethro was busy talking to God in the world. When the Garam come back, Moshe Mashiach, Jethro and the Garam, there you go. I am Hashem your God. No other gods. Done deal. Mashiach and Gula can come. But God says through David, the King David and Tehillim, God won't bring redemption until they're geared to Shabbos with God. There's no universal Shabbat until there's a nation to bring Shabbat in. So the Jews have been doing it. And God says, where are the Garim? Where is the name Elohim? The name of creation. Hashem Elohim. So the Garim come out of idolatry. They say, no more. You're right, God. There are no other gods. Now we're joining up with I am Hashem, your God. Shabbos comes to the world. With that said, we'll pick up next week in gear number two in Thinking Shabbos. Wish you all a good Shabbos. I wish you all good thoughts on Shabbos.